Welcome, APUSH. Happy Friday. It's over. Week two, we survived. Thank you so much for all of the consistent, high quality work that you've been turning in this week. We are finishing up the 1970s today by taking a look at Gerald Ford and Jimmy Carter's presidency. So while I transition us to our slides, I am going to remind you, make sure that you have your um, paper out, a writing utensil, and everything that you need to successfully uh, copy down things from this lecture. I'll give you guys another moment to gather that material. Great. So today we are going to be starting immediately post Watergate with the Gerald Ford presidency. So Gerald Ford was Richard Nixon's vice president. His original vice president, uh, VP Agnew, had been removed from office for other <laughs> corruption issues. So you can put sense of theme in the Nixon presidency. And so Gerald Ford was nominated as vice president, but was never actually elected into the vice presidency. And so when he became president, he is the first president and only to receive the presidency without ever actually being elected by the American people. So he's off to a rough start. And he lost respect very quickly when he granted a full pardon to Richard Nixon for all crimes. Ford justified this with the excuse that it was going to put an end to the Watergate scandal. But many Americans saw this as a what they called a corrupt bargain, which deepened their distrust of the government. Another consequence of the Watergate scandal is the economy. Nixon had been so preoccupied by trying to uh, push back against Watergate that by 1974, the economy had burned, returned to a state of stagflation. As a reminder, stagflation refers to when both unemployment and inflation is rising. Ford tried to combat this with his program WIN, which stands for Whip Inflation Now. The goal of WIN encouraged Americans to reduce spending and shop more, or shop widely, sorry. So reduce spending, so Americans should be reducing how much money they're spending, but also shop widely, which means look to other places to spend your money to help other businesses. However, this failed and the recession deepened even worse. He eventually agreed to some of the Democratic Congress's economic policies, but often he was shown uh, vetoing their bills to boost the economy, which again increased a negative look for him. Which leads us to the election of 1976. Ultimately, all of the progress that Nixon had made in trying to make the Republican Party a party for all white people, let me clarify. Um, so all of that progress that Nixon had made in unifying a white Republican party had been completely dismantled by the Watergate scandal. And so this led to the election of the 39th president, Jimmy Carter. Carter sold himself as an outsider, so not a typical politician, who lacked typical political corruption. Carter before this <laughs> was a peanut farmer. He was a known uh, Baptist Christian, and he seemed like the antithesis of this typical corrupted, uh, corruption president that Nixon and Ford had this oeuvre of. And despite the clear, close connection, I'm sorry, a cat is desperate to sit on a lap right now. And so despite this um, close election, <laughs> Sorry, you guys. Um, and so despite this uh, close election, Carter did win the presidency. And um, Democratic, the Democrats won strong majorities in both the House and the Senate. Now, now we are going to look at the Carter presidency in two different aspects. There's the other one. Whew. They, they're just trying to make this a really rough video, aren't they? Back to my place. Okay, so Carter's biggest campaign during his presidency was championing human rights. He appointed Andrew Young, 
who was the first African-American ambassador to the UN, and together they allied with the black majority of South Africa and Zimbabwe. So he, um, he along with his um, African-American prime minister, worked together to uh, push against this uh, white controlled, um, uh, white controlled African countries. He also cut off um, all aid to Argentina and Chile in response to their human rights violations. So he saw these governments as uh, showing huge um, human rights violations. And so he said, okay, you're cut off. We're not giving you guys any more money. And he also set up the legislation that would eventually return the Panama Canal to the people of Pan uh, Panama. So we remember the Panama Canal from um, Theodore Roosevelt, and he, Carter is the one that reverses a lot of those damaging decisions and returns that back to the people who live in that country. His most famous um, human rights endeavor were the Camp David Accords. In 1978, Carter arranged peace talks between Israel and Egypt, who were on the verge of war consistently. This was a major milestone in establishing peace within the Middle East. These, uh, the Middle East had, as I'm sure you guys remember from your uh, world history class, they were under a lot of strain after World War II. And so this is the, a very concrete effort in trying to unite the Middle East and stop some of this conflict. However, the Middle East also held Carter's greatest obstacle and what is honestly his biggest um, damage to his presidency, his presidency. In Iran, there were major anti-American sentiments since the United States backed a dictator over a democratically elected leader in 1953. And so in 1979, after years of built up resentment, Islamic fu fundamentalists overthrew the US leader, uh, the US backed dictators, and they cut off oil production, which led to high prices and a worldwide shortage of oil. Members of the U.S. Embassy actually, were actually kidnapped by militants, and this is leading to what we call the Iran hostage crisis. Give you guys a chance to write that down. So again, the Iran hostage crisis is when U.S. Embassy members were kidnapped by um, Islamic fundamentalists. And despite Carter's efforts to try to free these captives, he was never able to negotiate their release. And as a show of um, force and disapproval of Carter, they wait until um, the day after he leaves the presidency to release the captives. So they very much did not want to release captives underneath Carter's, um, Carter's presidency. And this is often considered the biggest blight on his presidential career is this hostage crisis. And so while we see Vietnam kind of de-escalating uh, Cold War tensions between uh, Nixon and China, during the Carter years, we see the Cold War start to get uh, hot again. Now we're going to look at his domestic speech, I mean his domestic years. Carter was never able to fully recover the Nixon and Ford economy. Inflation and unemployment continued to grow. And to accommodate this, Carter had to cut federal spending on many social programs. He also moved towards deregulation. And remember, deregulation is less a government involvement with uh, corporations or industry, which leads to deindustrialization. Now, deindustrialization de is a um, is where we see a Ne negative things happen to um, U.S. manufacturing centers like railroads, trucking, and airlines. So deindustrialization de is when these different uh, organizations or companies uh, start to uh, receive damage. Oops. Okay. And in the United States, the Northeast or Midwest became known as the Rust Belt. And this is refer referring to their former splendor as industrial leaders. Carter continued to make mistakes in 1979 with his Malays speech. Now, in this speech, it was called the Malays speech because he chastised the American people 
for both moral and spiritual decline. So many people saw that as like pandering to the American audience and getting, uh, putting blame towards them that honestly was not deserved. And by 1980, when he left office, his approval rating was at a 23%, which is extremely low. I think that Carter gets a bad rap. If you guys want to talk more about that, join me in Zoom, and I'm sure I can enlighten you. But yes, yeah, so I think that Carter gets a bad rap because he got a very, very bad government from Ford and Nixon, and there really isn't so much that he could do. <laughs> and he did a lot of good things, but it's easy to focus on the bad. Anyways. During the 1970s, we also see this is um, both under the Ford and the uh, Nixon, Ford, and Carter presidency, but we're going to look at a very important domestic movement, which is the environmental movement that's happening at this time. Culturally, in the 1970s, we see this new trend environmentalism. The first Earth Day took place in 1970, and the, environment, the environmental movement began in earnest with the publishing of Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring which criticizes the wide use of pesticides and its effect on wildlife. Environmental disasters like oil spills got the American public's attention and showed them and gave them frustration with um, the way that the industries were treating the environment. And this culminated with Three Mile Island, where an accident involving nuclear power took place. This was in Pennsylvania in 1979. To appease these environmental activists, Congress passed several pieces of legislation, including the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, and the Clean Air Act. Again, this is in 1970. Congress also passed, passed laws protecting water, endangered species, and cleaning toxic dumps. However, despite all of these uh, positive, this positive progress towards environmentalism in the 1970s, we see a lot of conservative resistance to this in the 1980s, which we will be looking at later. So that is the 1970s, we are done. <laughs> um, please make sure that you have those notes accessible for your uh, class packet today. Before I show you guys your oral drill terms, I want to remind you to um, complete your class packet. And as a heads up, today's short, an uh, short answer question, your exit ticket is going to be a quiz grade. Remember, you are giving me key terms and you're fully explaining it. It is a quiz grade. It is a quiz grade. It is a quiz grade. Please be thorough in your analysis and your answers. The biggest problem that I've seen in short answer questions lately is just the need to be um, quick and not being thorough. So just be thorough in your answers. I do not have um, a slide with your oral drill quiz terms, so let me um, let me get that taken care of. Just one moment. I'm going to pause my recording and increase the and write down these terms. Just give me two seconds. Great, I am back. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Do -do -do. Sorry about that, you guys. Okay. So these are your oral drill terms. You have the Iran hostage crisis, that stagflation, Watergate, the 1976 election, and Silent Spring. You'll notice that all of these came from today's lecture. So if you did today's lecture, you know what the responses are. Um, great. So make sure you take five minutes to do that. This is going to count towards your participation. Again, one more time. This exit ticket is a quiz grade. Take your time. Be thorough. Awesome. You have extra time because you don't have electives in the afternoon. I hope you guys have a wonderful weekend. I'm gonna stop share. Have a wonderful weekend. Please free, feel free to reach out to me anytime if you have any concerns about remote learning. Remember, the AP exam is still happening, so we need to be taking this learning just as seriously as we were when we were in person. I'm really impressed with the work that you guys have done um, over these last two weeks of remote learning. I know it's been a big adjustment, but I look forward to seeing you guys in person, hopefully sooner rather than later, but what's important is that we're all safe. Um, as always, hop on Zoom with me from uh, today's Friday, so just from 1120 to noon, so make sure if you have any questions, get them done quickly, because otherwise I might not be able to respond. So reach out to me if you can. I look forward to hearing from you guys, and as always, have a wonderful weekend. Stay safe, use hand sanitizer, and take care of yourselves. Talk to you guys later.